We've been talking a little bit about where music comes from and what it is for, and um, about the spiritual and uh, ritualistic origins of music and maybe all art forms. But now what I want to talk about is a little bit more how, about how music works. So John talked about these goosebumps, these intense emotional experiences that music can produce in us. Well, how do these come about? How, how does music achieve that? And does science have anything to say about that? And in fact, it does. <laughs> so, in order to understand how music works, we need to understand how the brain works. And the, one of the more, perhaps most prominent theories at the moment as to what, that tries to explain why we humans have these really large brains compared to our body size is that one of the primary functions of the brain is to predict the future. Yeah? So, our brains have evolved to forecast what will happen next. So the purpose of memory, for example, is not memory in itself. It's not, we don't have memory so we can remember things. We have memory in order to use that information to predict what will come next. And um, music plays on this brain's capacity and automatic way of decoding and trying to figure out what comes next by creating structures and by creating expectations. And music creates expectations basically in two ways. It creates expectations about what will happen next, so for in terms of specific harmonies that might happen, and it creates expectations in relation to when this will happen. So you can think of rhythm, pulses, and beats as ways and regularities that set up expectations which can then be uh, fulfilled or they can be violated. So how does the brain code these expectations and whether they are fulfilled or not? Well, the, there's one particular neurochemical or neurotransmitter, as it's called, that is very important for the coding of expectations and whether they are fulfilled or not. And you probably have come across it before. Its name is dopamine. Dopamine is involved in many things, it's, but its primary function is to call reward. So let's say something uh, as a, a very pleasant food that you're eating, but all other kinds of pleasures are called by dopamine. And um, so there has been, so I just want to summarize one little study, or big study that has been um, done a few years ago, which asked exactly that question. So do these does music produce these chill, musical chills, as they are called uh, in the scientific literature often? Is this probably a result of the release of dopamine? Now, to study um, pleasure that results from music, the study is not easy because we all have very different tastes in music. So music is highly individualized, it's very culturally specific, you know, it changes, our, our, even our own tastes change all the time. So, how, how would we do science to create? these sorts of um, intense emotional experiences reliably across a large number of people so that we could do maths and statistics and science on it. And uh, a group of researchers from Canada did a really clever, a beautiful experimental design and they circumvented the question by simply asking people to bring music that they incredibly liked. So people were first asked to sort of decide and bring their own experiment to the experiment, uh, their own experiment to the experiment own music to the experiment, the favorite music. And then what the researchers did is they recorded using, uh, again, brain imaging techniques, and this time much more fancier stuff where you get radioactive things injected into your blood and then the dopamine gets lights up. It's all very complicated, but we don't need to get into that now. The main point is people's brains, while they were listening to their most favorite music, indeed released more dopamine than when they were listening to other people's favorite music. And this is a very clever design that gets around the idea that music is so subjective and the experience and our pleasure from it is so um, unique. So dopamine indeed predicts and relates to these sort of intense emotional experience that we get. So the next question we can ask now is, well, what are the best predictors or best ways of, for this dopamine release? Like, how can we maximize this sorts of release in order to get the best emotional experience. And it turns out that despite the highly individualized nature of music, there are certain things in, mute, in, in, in music that are particularly good at this. And the reason 
they are good at this is because they create something that is called positive prediction error. And that relates to the idea that well, when would be most when when would dopamine be most released in your brain? And it will be released the most if you get surprised. So let's say you expected a reward, you expected you would go on your way to a nice restaurant, and you expected to get some really good food, and you find out that uh, actually the food is free. So that's called a positive prediction error because you get something really nice, and it's even better than you expected. <coughs> So better than expected experiences create really strong dopamine releases and really strong emotional responses. And music can do that too, but it does it much more subtly in a much more complex and intricate way. So you can think of, for example, principles. In order to, to, to create a prediction, the first thing is you need to establish a regularity. So for example, we talked about rhythm, for example. Another thing is symmetry. So a lot of structures in music are symmetrical. So something ends the way it started. And that tells your brain that a certain aspect or a phrase or a pattern that has begun is now over. Now, think of a situation where, for example, you create a phrase and you like that. So you listen to a phrase for the first time and you really love it. And now the same phrase, which you are already expecting now, comes again throughout the course of the piece of music, but all of a sudden it's louder, or it's faster, or it's played by more instruments, or it comes back in different places, it echoes around the orchestra, for example. Those are all situations which create better than expected experiences. And this is perhaps one way how music works and creates pleasure. But before I leave the stage, I want to quickly suggest an answer to the uh, Stradivarius mystery that uh, John earlier articulated. And uh, my suggestion would be that the scientists who have been looking for what makes the Stradivarius special have looked in the wrong place. Because just as the sky doesn't have color, the Stradivarius doesn't have beauty. If you want to have, understand where beauty comes from, you need to look at the people who perceive it and not in the object. <laughs>